Welcome to another GCN Tech Clinic where we answer the questions that you've been submitting using the hashtag AskGCNTech. So I guess we'll dive straight in and answer the first one. First up this week, we've got Philip Culture. Hey guys, love your show. My question is, after deep cleaning my bike, do I have to grease and oil the derailleurs or is it just enough to oil the chain? He also asks, what about cleaning bikes with DI2? Is there anything special to be aware of? Thanks very much and greetings from Germany. Um, so after a deep clean on your bike, you are obviously going to need to dry it off as best as possible and that's one of the best things you can do firstly. But you won't need to lubricate the derailleurs themselves, they've got sealed mechanisms and units so that'll be perfectly fine just to leave as it is. But you will need to lubricate your chain and that's something that you should do every time after you wash and clean your bike, make sure you lubricate that correctly. And in terms of um, anything different that you need to do with DI2, well it's exactly the same as a mechanical group set, so the only things you should be mindful of are avoiding blasting water directly into the components, but a DI2 group set is just the same maintenance process as what you would do with a mechanical one, so that's pretty simple. Next up, we've got Jeff Williams who asks, um, he uses his bicycle all year round in Canada where he says they have a real winter, which is obviously good. When he's been cycling, he finds that he's getting slippage of his gears which feels like they're trying to shift gears even when he's not, and that's mostly on the cassette, is more noticeable at lower temperatures, which he says circa minus 15, which is pretty bloody cold if you ask me. Uh, is it just a badly adjusted shifter, or could it be related to the temperature? So says his bike is mechanical with no hydraulics or electronics on it, and that only recently his local bike shop did a bit of a tune-up for him. So he says normally they do generally good work, so he tends to trust them. Um, well, yeah, so it's nice to hear from someone who rides in a real winter. We quite often get a little bit of stick from people that say, oh, the British winter's not cold enough and you guys just ride in a little bit of rain now and again. So fair play to you for riding in minus 15. Um, and in relation to your slipping gears, I think it's most likely to be that the indexing just isn't quite right. And if your bike has been to the bike shop recently, it could be that they've made some minor adjustments to it and it's just gone slightly out of a line or they might have fitted a new um, inner gear cable and it might have just settled in. So my best advice would be just take it back to the bike shop, explain that the gears aren't quite right and I'm sure they'll have that sorted in no time at all and it should just be a minor case of uh, adjusting the indexing and you have perfectly working gears again. And next up we've got Sanjay Khan who asks, hey guys, I've bought a Stages left-sided power meter, good investment there. Um, do I need to spend more money and buy a bike computer or will my smartphone be able to show my power whilst I'm riding? As I said, yeah, good investment into a power meter. There's a good training tool to have there. And you don't need to specifically buy a bike computer to get a power reading from that crank. Stages, ha Stages cranks do have a smartphone app that you can use to pair up to the crank and that will display the power and the cadence whilst you're riding along. So if you've got a mount that puts your smartphone onto the handlebars, you could use that. The only downside to using that app is it won't enable you to record that data. So you'll only be able to view it live and you've only got some very basic metrics. It doesn't operate in the same way as a bike computer. So it's not quite the same as that, but you don't have to use that. So that gives another option. But if you've got a bit of money, then you're gonna be able to invest into a bike computer and it'll give you a far greater spread of information and you can be able to record all that data. So that might be a slightly better option. There are other, other apps out there that might link up and pair, but they tend to only work with a power meter that they were specifically designed for. Next up, we've got John Mayer. He says, hey, Alex and Ollie, um, I'm an under 14 junior and have bought a 16 to 27 cassette. I've installed it properly, but the last sprocket on it is touching the inside of my Vitus Vitesse Evo seat stay. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Um, is there any sort of space that will stop this or what shall I do? Thanks in advance. Um, a very good question. It reminds me of back when I was a under 14 and under 16 trying to fit those funny sized cassettes onto my bike to meet the gear restriction requirements. Um, one of the things you are going to struggle a little bit with this because bikes don't tend to be designed with a smaller sprocket of a 16 because it's quite a large size sprocket. The advice that I would say is to check that you haven't got any unnecessary spaces at the back of the cassette because that will mean it can move across a little bit more and create a slight, slight gap it might fit. But if you're still struggling with that, you could remove a sprocket from the cassette and then space the back end of the cassette out so that it shifts the whole cassette across towards the center of the wheel a little bit more and then the 16 
two sprocket will be a little bit further away, which is not ideal, and you are going to lose one of your sprockets, so you'll have one less gear on the cassette, which is, as I said, not ideal. Um, and you might find one of the best options is to use a slightly different cassette that maybe uses a, a 15 or a 14 tooth as the smallest sprocket, which will mean you go over your gear restriction, but you'll have to use a um, chain ring that relates to give you the same overall gear ratio. So you might have to experiment a little bit with that with the gear ratios just to try and get that perfectly. But I think you are going to be up against it a little bit to get that 16 tooth to clear the frame and not cause any damage to it. So a bit of trial and error and you should get that sorted. I've got Jim Rayner who asks, why don't we see a front disc wheel used in time trials? That's a really good question actually and something a few people have asked me in the past before. And out on the road, you don't tend to see a front disc wheel being used as in a front um, aero disc wheel, not a disc brake wheel, and because of the wind conditions. Whilst you could actually technically use it, the wind conditions catch the side of the wheel and can make it incredibly unstable, meaning that when riders are tucked in on the time trial ski bars, that you have very little control over the bike, meaning you could easily crash and lose control. No one wants that, do they? But indoors, on the velodrome for example, you do regularly see pursuit riders and some of the sprint riders using a disc wheel on the front and the back because well, there's no wind inside on the velodrome to put them off course, so that's, that's why that tends to be. Particularly on windy days outside, you will see time trial riders and road racers using a slightly shallower front wheel to account for those wind conditions and help them remain stable and in control. So that rounds off another really good GCN tech clinic. So thanks very much for those questions. And as usual, do keep your questions coming using the hashtag AskGCNTech. And that's it for this week. See you later.